This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. Okay, members, you're all very welcome um, to the meeting this morning. In the room with me today, I have Robin Newton and Andy Allen. Okay. And at present on Starleaf, we have Fran McCann, Karen Mullen, Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Alex Easton, Mark Durkin, and Sinead Ennis. So we've got a full house today. Um, I'll move to agenda item one as apologies. Um, there are uh, no apologies. I'll go to agenda item two then, which is chairperson's business. Uh, members, you'll be aware of the issues raised uh, this week in relation to the Sports Sustainability Fund. The fund is intended to complement other interventions for the sports sector, including the Sports Hardship Fund and the COVID Safe Sport Packs. Members, the fund has been administered by Sports NI and was open from the 1st of December 2020 to the 20th of January 21. Clubs applying for this fund had to apply through their, re their respective governing bodies and not directly to Sport NI. The clubs and entities' guidance notes published by Sport NI laid out the conditions for the programme and stated that the purpose of the fund is to deal with the economic consequences of the pandemic, providing the intervention needed to prevent the sports sector being unduly impacted. Applications to the fund had to provide evidence of financial need due to COVID-19. That was specifically defined as being the difference between the current period surplus deficit from the 1st of April 2020 to the 31st of December 2020 and the average sur surplus deficit from the previous years. Um, members, the Minister and Sport NI officials have been requested to brief us next week. We are currently awaiting confirmation of their availability. This could mean an extra meeting, possibly next Wednesday, as well as a meeting next Thursday, unless members are willing to consider an all-day all meeting on either of those days. Um, members, I took it upon myself yesterday whenever I um, got the, information, all the full information through um, to put Sport NI, the Minister and the Department on notice. Um, of course, it will be up to this committee as to whether we ask for them to come in next week or not. I think given um, the, some of the amounts of money that have been handed out, I think it is, is paramount that we get them in sooner rather than later. So I'm just going to open up for any comments around that. Anybody want to comment? Kelly? Um, Chair, I um, support your approach. Um, there does seem to have been some sort of a change from the original objectives through to the application form. Um, I would be keen to just tease that out with the Minister um, and with Sport NI. Um, the original paperwork, when it was scoped out for the aims and objectives, included um, the threat of closure to those sporting um, organisations. And while we know that there was a horrendous loss of income um, due to the pandemic, um, I would be keen just to understand um, how that worked. Um, we've also heard from a number of smaller sporting bodies or sporting organisations, sorry, that don't appear to have been notified about the funding from their sports governing body. Um, it would be good to tease that out just to make sure that all who could possibly apply were able to. Um, so I absolutely support. And to be honest, I'm available, whatever's needed on this, whether it's an all day meeting or um, we meet on the Wednesday, whatever suits um, the minister and, and of course, Sport NI. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Mark Durkin, Mark, are you your hand up? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, certainly I would concur with that approach. I do think we need the Minister, and more so even Sport and NIN, to explain how this fund uh, was administered. There, there is quite a bit of concern out there. I mean, that this is public money, and I'm not trying to de detract from any way those who received funding. However, there are, as Kelly said, a multitude of clubs and organisations and sporting codes out there who are in serious, massive uh, need and who have got nothing, who maybe weren't eligible for this fund per se, but it's important that those that do need help get the help that they needed. And when people haven't been able to get any help and see other organisations or clubs get help to the extent that some of them have received it in, in this programme, then it, it, it's, it's sort of hard for them to take and comprehend. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else want to make a comment? Or sure. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Who's yeah, it's Sinead here. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, no, listen, I, um, you know, I, I support the approach uh, that you've outlined there, Chair. Um, we, uh, you know, if, we have to bear in mind that the, the, the Sports Sustainability Fund was set up in good faith and the purpose of it was to to help sporting bodies. Um, and we have to be mindful that a lot a lot of those clubs, organisations and, and governing bodies were at the forefront of the pandemic all along. So I think we just need to... Um, 
to get Sport NI in front of us. And we have to be mindful as well that built into any of those contracts um, with, uh, you know, as part of the business case is the uh, ability, uh, avail- the um, option that Sport and I have to um, to investigate any money that, you know, maybe wasn't, was given out in error. But I think we need to wait and see what, uh, what the outcome of our conversations are next week. No, that's fine. Thank you, Sinead. Anybody else want to make a comment on that? I, I just I, I don't want to pre- prejudge at this stage, absolutely, and I know certainly for, from a committee perspective, um, members that have highlighted it, we quite rightly were uh, writing on behalf of those many clubs that actually didn't have the opportunity to uh, even apply for the Sports Sustainability Fund due to all the issues around LRS and being promised that money and then that being denied. Um, so I, there, there's a, there is a wider issue here. So I think if with members' um, permission then, we will move on. We will have plenty of time to debate this next week. Sorry, Alex, did you want to come in? Um, just quickly, um, I, I'm happy to meet an extra day if you want or an all-day session. Um, it's just important that we get to the bottom of this. Um, so um, whatever seats, I'm, I'm happy to do. So thank you. Okay, thank you, members. Um, sure. Andy, just, just very quickly again, um, like colleagues, I would echo um, the approach uh, and whatever needs to be done next week in terms of availability, I'll make myself available. And, and that other concern that you highlight in relation to the localised restricting support scheme is key here because um, I'm sure you're aware, as as, uh, as am I, of clubs who haven't been able to organisations who haven't been able to avail of the sports sustainability fund, and it's imperative that they're able to um, get financial support out of the LRSAS scheme. And I think we need to further establish that. Uh, I see a letter in our pack uh, in relation to the Minister of Finance highlighting our queries um, about that information being being conveyed to officials around the, the fund being available. But I think we need a categorical. Um, reassurance that those clubs who have not been able to get support under the Sports Sustainability Fund will be able to apply uh, and potentially have their application um, progressed through LRSS. Oh, thank you for that, Andy. And I know whenever I had asked the Minister the same, the, the same question in question time, either last week or the week before, um, he had said that he was aware of it and that he was actively looking at that um, to see if, if they can address those clubs um, that have fallen between the cracks. Um, So, members, look, I'm quite conscious we will have a long meeting on this next week, I would imagine, and we'll go into a lot more detail. Are members content, then, um, that we move on? Agreed. Okay, members, thank you. Okay, we're going to move to agenda item three, which is draft minutes. Members, you'll find the draft minutes of the 18th of March 2021 at page six of your meeting pack. Can I ask, members, are you content with the minutes as drafted? Agreed. Thank you. Move on, then, to agenda item four, which is matters arising. Um, we've got a few here, so just bear with me. Can I inform members that have been provided at page 23 with a ministerial response in relation to the COVID recognition payment for voluntary and community sector? The minister states that the emergencies leadership group established just before the first lockdown has not called for a recognition payment for the sector, but has sought support for sectoral workers and volunteers to be able to manage their mental health and well-being, and DFC has funded the Sectoral Workforce Wellbeing Programme, which began before Christmas and will continue to run to next year. In the context of the Minister's commitment to fair work and workers' rights, she is also concluding um, to review a a review of funding approaches, including the contributions made to salaries and pensions for workers in this sector. Um, members, I, I, I'm, I'm not overly happy with that response myself. I know we did get a good response from the Minister for Health. I think that was last week where he had said he would be looking um, at uh, a recognition payment for those that fall in line or do a similar job um, to those in the statutory sector. Um, members, any comments? They want to or are content to note that uh, response? No, uh, so, Chair, I think I would share your disappointment. In that, and uh, while we take at face value the Minister's commitment to improving conditions and uh, rights for for workers in the sector, we'd really like to see some (laughs) tangible evidence of that as well. And this would have been a a small way of of showing that appreciation. In an ideal world, we'll see a a bigger way, and we will uh, see the Minister come back with proposals to improve the paying conditions of those uh, in, in that sector on a permanent fit, and I'm, I'm sure they would appreciate that more than, than this uh, recognition payment, to be honest. Yeah, 
um, I know that. Anybody else, any comment? Are you content to note and we move on? Content? Okay. Members can ask you then to turn to page 25 where you'll see a ministerial response in relation to the proposed 2030 World Cup Football World Cup bid. The Minister states that both the Department um, or sorry, that both the Department for the Economy and Tourism and I are representing the executive in this bid. The FC continues to participate in meetings and workshops in, uh, as appropriate, but its key input is focused on determining the provision of suitable facilities. In relation to the sub-regional stadia programme, it is hoped that a well-designed programme may attract the potential benefit of providing training venues for participating international teams. Again, members, any comments? Are they content to note at this stage? Content to note? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Robin, go ahead, and then Mark will come to you. Or sorry, was it Andy? No. No, Robin, go ahead. Uh, Chair, can I just, uh, I mean, is the only ambition to provide training facilities rather than matches? Well, I don't know what the, what capacity is required for, for World Cup matches. Well, I, I know it's a significant capacity, but um, it seems as if our, from the response that our ambitions are really only to, at this stage anyway, to look at the potential of playing or allowing training facilities. Okay, no, good point. Mark? Uh, just, uh, I suppose, in terms of what Robin has asked there, now, I know when this issue was raised, I think Sinead helpfully uh, contributed or, or stated correctly that uh, the capacity needed to host a game is, is, is 40,000. Now, we've no stadium anywhere near that capacity currently here in the north. Hopefully, before too long, we'll, we'll have one with a capacity near 35,000. And then we, we can argue the toss with, with FIFA then. It's unthinkable that a tournament of this prestige would come to, to these islands and Northern Ireland not get a, a crack or a fair share at hosting games. With regards to training facilities, I'd actually mentioned that, that the opportunities wouldn't just exist to host games. But uh, for, for for other places, they have training camps, and where teams, countries, nations could, could set up their training camps. So it was important to have facilities there. So that might be where they're coming from. There, Robin, the, the bit that I was going to ask about, or that interests me, there is just officials from my department continue to provide support and participate in workshop. So does that mean then that work has started on this? And I know it's one for the economy. But, but it, it, it's one we should probably be asking them. Is this committee's responsibility for, or overseeing sport? Uh, we, we should wonder where they are and that, you know, how many engagements have there been and how far away are we from from about? No, Mark, we can certainly do that. We can ask the Department for the Economy those questions. Robin, did you want to come back in? No, I think Mark's approach is uh, uh, very appropriate, and I think uh, if Mark would be prepared to turn his proposal into that we do enter into correspondence uh, on the matter just to seek the clarity, I think that would be useful. OK. OK, members agreed with that, then, that we, we write to the Department for Economy for clarity on the issue? Yeah? Yeah. OK. All right, members, happy to move on then. Um, can we then turn to page 27, where you'll find a ministerial response in re relation to welfare reform mitigation measures. Um, the department has noted the committee's concerns at a time this has taken to progress the legislation and will seek to expedite the matter. However, it is not currently possible to provide a definitive timeline for the introduction of the legislation. Proposals for the review are currently under consideration and these will be shared with the committee at the earliest opportunity. And the department is fully committed to a co-production and co-design approach to the welfare mitigation measures and intends to undertake meaningful engagement with a range of stakeholders, which is expected to include organisations such as Cliff Edge Coalition NI, the UC and UCS. Formal engagement has not taken place because the review has not yet commenced. The committee will be kept fully informed of the progress of the review and provided with the opportunity to engage in the co-design pro uh, progress. Um, I, I think members know my opinion on this, so I'm just going to open it up to the floor for any comments, Andy. Yeah, sure. Um, to be quite honest, I'm somewhat disappointed by this. Um, it's well over a year since we've come back to these institutions. I, I appreciate fully that the department and the minister 
and, and all the resources had to be pivoted towards the pandemic, and rightly so. However, um, I recall back when we had a um, important discussion and debate around this issue, around how officials were working actively and proactively behind the scenes um, in the absence of these devolved institutions to create legislation, perhaps at Westminster, was maybe going to have to take forward. I don't see how, over a year on, we're in a situation whereby we haven't seen um, the, the strengthened uh, and extended welfare mitigations. I, I welcome the Minister's full commitment in respect of extending and strengthening the mitigations. That is very welcome, but it's important to have a wider conversation and dialogue on this. And to simply keep kicking the can down the road by a technical financial arrangement simply is not good enough. And I think the Department need to come forward with more definitive timelines to this committee. Thank you, Andy. Um, Kelly, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I just wanted to double check. I appreciate that the Minister has stated very clearly that the existing mitigations will continue on and that people won't face financial hardship um, because we have a cut off of 31st of March. But could we just get clarification from um, the Department exactly how that's able to happen? Um, because I've been looking and checking and I'm still seeing the cutoff date of the 31st of March. Um, if there's been changes to regulations, and forgive me if we've already discussed it, but I just can't find it. I just want to make sure that legally that we're OK. We are a scrutiny committee. Um, we're here as much to scrutinise the minister as to help the minister. Um, can we just get clarification from the department how the existing mitigation measures will continue on until such times as the consultation period on the welfare reform mitigations completes a new procedures are in place. Um, I just want to make sure that everything's legal. No, thank you for that, Kelly. And certainly if you can't find it, I would imagine it's not there. And to be perfectly honest, because you are rather good at finding things. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree with that issue. Mark, your hand is still up, or do you want to come in there? No? No, so, sorry, Chair, that's fine. The points have been made. So. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mark. Okay, members, I, I don't. I, I feel as a committee that this is not good enough, and as Andy and others have said, we have been asking to see this since this, co this committee um, formed back in January last year, and, um, and I know COVID has, has yeah. taken over in many areas, but I think that uh, certainly uh, when it comes to the committee, um, we've, we have been done a bit of a disservice when it comes to welfare reform. Um, it is something that we do have an interest in. So I think Kelly's proposal absolutely to write and ask for the, um, the legal backing behind the decisions that are being made is certainly something that we should be asking for. Are members content um, with that at this present? Or Andy, if you have further right, proposals yeah, or something? Can I just expand on that? Um, yeah. Given the time it will take for any legislation or regulations to potentially to progress through the committee and be properly scrutinised, can we ask the part, department for definitive clarification if they are going to, um, and if they, the provision exists through the financial technical arrangement, how long they potentially, because that's how I would assume it, they're going to propose, like they've done previously, to extend the uh, provision to enable the, the payments to be made, how long they envisage having to extend that provision to? Yep, no, we can ask for that, certainly, as well. I mean, my point about the review has always been, do you, I mean, do, does the minister and does the department believe that what we have is actually the best that we can have at this? You know, are, are we not? Should we not be aiming for something different? Do we not need to review this now and say this has worked and this hasn't worked? Um, could we put this money somewhere else that is going to benefit more people um, within the welfare uh, benefit system? So I, I mean, I, I, I think it, it absolutely should have been reviewed at this stage. Um, but we'll just wait and see um, what comes back to us, I suppose, on that. Are members happy enough with those proposals? And we'll move on. Yeah? OK. Yeah. Right, members, I can ask you then to turn to page 29, where you'll see a ministerial response in relation to the sub-regional stadia programme. The reply states that once the analysis of a club survey has been completed, the minister will present recommendations to the executive. No separate budget currently exists for the programme and a bid will be made in due course for the appropriate amount of funding. The Department understands that the Executive will prioritise such an allocation given that it is a flagship investment project. Again, can I ask members, have they any comments or are they content to note that at this stage? Kelly? Yes, Chair, I was just thinking, um, the original allocation um, of the money was 10 years ago. Um, and we've seen from other builds that have happened to do with sports, you know, you can have a significant increase in costs. I'm just wondering, um, 
I know. Well, I suppose this, this, the the minister and the department are going to go out and and, and review, or are currently reviewing this at the moment. But I'm just wondering how much of a potential uplift will there be to the original amount of money talked about ten years ago? Because um, costs will have changed certainly. Um, clubs have who have been waiting for this money, patiently waiting for this money, um, are now in quite decrepit facilities in some cases. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's if we could just check with the department that if if there is scope to increase the allocation um, or increase the amount that's going to be able to be offered. Okay, we can certainly, I know, I mean, I suppose whenever they do the analysis of the club survey, um, it might come back then that further uh, or increased funding is required once that analysis is complete. Um, so I would maybe we could ask, is that part of the analysis then, is to look at the, the, the funding around it? Andy, did you want to come in? Yeah, Chair, and I've made this point on a number of occasions. Um, I'd agree with Kelly, and, and with Dave, we've asked this question around, you know, the um, the total uh, amount that will be committed to um, sub-regional. It was quite clearly um, stated that you can't compare like for like, and there's no attempt to do so uh, in many respects. But we need to ensure that the clubs that are going to avail of sub regional do get the maximum out of it. Um, but I'm just not sure that the department that's at this stage aren't able to provide us with a definitive timeline again. Um, a lot of the clubs that I've spoken to would all indicate to me that they have provided all the information that they've been asked for from the department. Um, and they don't understand um, what the delay is and the further delay. So I don't see why the department can't definitively say to us, we are hoping to have sub-regional open by X, Y date. I really don't see it. Thank you, Andy. Robin? No, I very much concur with what Andy has said, Chair. Uh, the amount of frustration around this, and as you rightly said, you know, it was 10 years ago when this money was allocated. And I, I do... Uh, I do have some concerns about that one line or two lines in the, the letter. <clears throat> uh, for the appropriate amount of funding for the programme, and it will be allocated as part of the budget process in the year it is needed. I mean, it's needed now, Chair. It's not, you know, it's been needed for 10 years. It's been recognised that it was needed for 10 years. And it is the understanding that the executive will prioritise such an allocation. It is, as part of the new decade, new approach, already a priority within the executive. So I would be concerned about that the penultimate paragraph containing those couple of lines, Chair. Okay. It doesn't give any encouragement to the clubs who have expended, in some cases, significant sums of money on design and costings and uh, professional fees of all sorts. Okay, members, then following on from that, um, then do we write back to the department to ask for a, a, a timeline of and, and raise those issues as well as what further analysis needs to take place um, with the clubs and a timeline for when this will be done? Yes? Agreement? Yeah, Chair, can I just come on there? Yes, sorry. Well, I suppose my understanding, uh, looking at this and, and the discussions been had around the 10 years, so any uh, rationale or reasoning for, for this review would include costings, because I know my local club uh, here had done uh, a costing in a business case two years ago, and I'm speaking to them, the costings don't even stand, and that's only two years. So I know that part of um, the department and the minister doing this is to get closer to that ballpark figure because it's certainly not going to be what it was 10 years ago um, and that then will enable herself and the department to go for that bid. I know that um, uh, Mr Newton there has said about uh, under new decade new approach but we're continuously being told there's a lot of stuff under new decade new approach that isn't going to be funded. Um, uh, I hope that this is and I hope that it's supported and that's why we need to get the proper f uh, figure because clubs have been um, waiting far too long for this and we need to get it over the line so I concur with everybody else and I would like to see more detail on that as well so thank you Chair Thank you Karen Okay our members then Just, have... just one Sorry. more we, we, we point and, well, I thought Karen, Karen was going to be, beat me to it there Chair, but it was just in terms of this, if we are writing back to the department, just to reiterate the need for a fair uh, regional spread of this budget, whatever, whatever the budget ends up being, but, but, but that it's uh, distributed fairly. 
to the, in a way that benefits clubs and locations across the north. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. Okay, are members happy enough then to move on? Happy with all those proposals? Yes? Okay. Right, can I ask you to turn to page 31 of your pack where you'll see a ministerial response in relation to the proposed departmental legislative time timetable. The Minister has asked officials for a more detailed assessment of the time needed for each proposed bill and also asked them to consider any emerging proposals, <coughs> including sign language, which will allow her to prioritise and plan for the remainder of this mandate. Um, I, I didn't think that sign language was an emerging proposal, albeit we know we didn't see it in our first draft that we got from the Minister and from the Department. Um, so it, it's positive to see that sign language will now be included on that. Um, but as, as we all know, we have a very limited period of time left within this mandate, and it's going to be extremely difficult. Um, so it'll be, it'll be um, good to see uh, the, a, a definitive timetable for this, and just to see how the committee can possibly manage um, to scrutinise the many bills that are coming in front of us. Um, members, any comments? Are they content to note this at this stage? Content. Okay. Can I then ask you to move to page 32, where you'll see a ministerial response in relation to local inclusive labour market partnerships. The minister states that great progress has been made towards progressing the labour market partnership model, including establishing local partnerships. And although the draft budget presents significant challenges, she will work hard to ensure that the necessary resources are targeted towards those most in need. I think this was following on from a conversation we had had where we had learned then that um, these partnerships were not going to be funded um, through the, through the, uh, towards the councils. Um, so uh, I suppose I would still have that worry about the funding for this, um, that we've pushed something else on the council and the funding hasn't followed for it. Um, so that's just still a, a bit of a worry. But um, I, I suppose at, at present, so I'm certainly content to note at present. I don't know about other members. Anything they want to say? No, nope, content? Okay. Mm -hmm. Members, then, can I ask you to turn to page 33 and you'll see a departmental response in relation to the draft programme for government. Um, the Minister will seek to have the, com the commitment to a standalone housing outcome um, in the New Deal, New, New, De or New, Deal New Approach Agreement, including um, included in the post consultation discussion with executive colleagues. Again, members, any comments or content to note? Andy? Chair, I'm just, just asking if, if colleagues are in agreement that we, we highlight to the executive the importance of such an outcome, given that housing is so cross-cutting right across you know, all the departments in the executive, whether that be education, uh, economy in respect of employment or, or the criminal justice system. It, it is, it's an important foundation, I think. It's absolutely essential and vital that we have a uh, measurement uh, tool that we can gauge how well we're delivering our, our, our housing. No, I agree. I'm happy enough with that. Members, are any comments? Are they content with Andy's proposal that we write in support yeah, of this? Second, that proposal, Chair, in uh, our perspective, I think Sean Kelly said earlier that we're here to scrutinise the Minister, yes, but we're here to support the Minister too, and that this is a case of, of us writing it in support of the Minister's ask here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, members, content that we move on then, yes? Okay, we'll move then to page 34. Um, where there's a ministerial response in relation to the DEF campaign group briefing on the VRS system. Officials have held discussions with various stakeholders, including the DEF campaign group, to look at the current accessibility of VRS across public services, including the potential for a regional VRS, the costs of which are likely to be substantial. Officials continue to be in contact with officials in Scotland to explore various models of VRS and a regional VRS for Northern Ireland would be cross-cutting service across all public bodies and as such it will be a matter for all departments. Currently the provision of VRS by DFC is funded from within those participating business areas, um, existing budgets and such there is no departmental VRS allocation. The Minister shares the committee's concerns that members of the deaf community are struggling to access advice services and has asked officials to consider current accessibility. Uh, to advice services through BSL and ISL and how this can be improved. The Minister has directed officials to continue their engagement with all relevant stakeholders and particularly the deaf community as part of the co-design and co-production of the framework of support which is necessary for BSL and ISL users, which includes the wider access to VRS. Um, members, um, any comments on that at this stage? Kelly? 
Chair, I'm a little bit concerned um, on this one because without that sign language act, um, all of those departments, you know, it's it's then there that the business areas are responsible for paying for um, translation services themselves. Without a sign language act, to be honest, it means then that that translation services will only be provided if money is available, as opposed to considering people's rights to be communicated with in a way that they can understand. Um, to be honest, at this stage, we can only note this. Um, we're, we hope that the de department will speak to the Scottish officials and come up with a solution here. But I think that um, this goes back to the disability strategy being extended and, and, and we need to perhaps write to the department to ask them in the disability strategy, which should be a cross-cutting strategy that all departments have to pay attention to and have, have cognizance of, um, that translation services should not be about money. It should be about the right for people to be able to be communicated with. And just because it's a very small in the greater picture of a small number in society. It's a growing number in society as well as we have a growing older population that tend then to move into having hearing issues. Um, so I think there's something there about um, asking the disability strategy um, what they are considering. Um, and obviously we know that the Sign Language Act, we hope will be coming forward, but it's to make sure that across all departments that it doesn't come down to, can we afford it? It comes down to what are we doing for people? Oh, I absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. I agree with that. So I think we can then write about and ask where it is in the disability strategy. Um, I suppose we. Uh, the, the other issue is, to, uh, because this is cross-cutting, this is right across all departments, this is an executive you know, matter for everyone, um, does it have to, have to fall under a sign language strategy or can it be a, can it be a standalone um, uh, piece? So I, I suppose that question could be asked as well. Um, from the executive also, um, because we know how important it is to to those members of our community, and um, yeah, and really they are being very much being are being discriminated against. Um, so if members are in agreement. We can ask that question as well. Yeah. Okay, members. Yes. All right. Happy to move on. Okay. Can I ask you then to turn to page thirty six, where you'll see a ministerial response in relation to the Model Engineer Society. Um, the Minister states that National Museums NI is keen to conclude <coughs> the relationship with MES on an amicable terms and have recently met with the Society to discuss their relocation plans. National Museums NI have advised DFC officials that they are committed to help facilitate and support the Society through this process. Um, members, I note from that there is no mention of financial help, which was something that um, Museums NI had spoken of at the time when they were in with us. So it really doesn't answer that question that we were asking. Um, uh, I know, uh, I see Alex, you have your hand up. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, can, can we go back to them and ask again? Um, it's just I'm very keen to press this. Um, they, gave, they gave a commitment and I expect them to honour that. So um, if we could keep up the pressure and, and contact the department again, I would really appreciate that. I've just been notified here by um, one of the clerks that there is a letter has been written specifically to do with the financial side that we haven't received a response on. So that I'm, I stand corrected on that. Oh, right. um, but hopefully we'll have that for um, our, our, our next meeting after Easter. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and I absolutely support Alex's point, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there is this ongoing perception that because the organisation had um, free access or, or were, were rent free um, in the walled garden in um, National Museum's NI property, that that this somehow allowed them to save up money. Um, we know that one of the reasons why National Museums NI want them off the premises is because when that group tried to raise funds through donations um, from people who, who went along to the train, um, that it was causing National Museums difficulties. So it's a bit unfortunate that the money hasn't been talked about here or the financial support hasn't been talked about because National Museums proactively did not want that group to raise money when they were there. While they may well have being there rent free, they had no opportunity to raise funds um, from the site. So, you know, an amicable resolution would be, you know, they they've evicted this group. An amicable resolution would be to help them to move. The group have now found an, an alternative premises. Um, 
they are going to move. I know that there has been a three month extension at this stage provided to give them time to get off the site. Um, but to be honest, it's over to NMNI at this stage. And, and I know we've written and we'd asked for that information to come back. Um, if NMNI are now saying that, or when they get the letter back, if they say that they're not providing financial help, that they're they're kindly not suing the group to get them off the premises. I think that um, as the fact that NMNI receives public money, that we have to push them to make sure that they provide support to this group, which will be a very expensive move. This is heavy equipment that's going to need um, cranes, I think, and, and low loaders to move some of their stuff. NMNI are taking back a resource that is owned by Northern Ireland. Um, and, you know, them. I'm sure they will be able to make money out of visitors um, going to that section um, in the future. So I think it's right and proper, as Alex has said, that we do keep pushing uh, this matter. Um, this is a group who could not make money um, and are now being forced off a site um, 50 years after after being there without being able to raise money from that site. So I think it's important that NMNI understand from this committee's point of view that while we accept that the contract and the terms of the contract have been followed, um, I think that this, com this continual referral to the fact that, that these guys had free use of the site for 50 years is a bit disingenuous given the fact that the group were not allowed to raise any money. Okay, thank you, Kelly, for that as well. Um, look, members, I know we're waiting on that letter coming back from um, the National National Museums NI. Are we happy that we wait until we get the response on that, and then once we get that response, we can then um, further act, given what, uh, dependent on the response? Yeah. Okay. All right, members, can I then ask you then to turn to page 37, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the allocation of national insurance numbers. Um, they're saying that telephone interviews are being carried out as a contingency if the national insurance number is required to pay benefits. They've also said that uh, someone can start work without a national insurance number as long as they can prove they have the right to work in the United Kingdom. And HMRC has confirmed that a person can still register for self-assessment without having a national insurance number. I know this was something that I brought up in committee following an inquiry that I had had. Um, I'm content with the, the response. Uh, members, any comments or content to note? Content? Good stuff. Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to move you then on to page 39, where you'll see a response from the Minister for Finance in relation to the Sports Sustainability Fund. The Minister states that officials in DFC are in regular communication with the Department of Finance on the interaction of the Sports Sustainability <coughs> Fund and the localised restrictions support scheme and land and property staff, service staff who are administering LRSS continue to be fully briefed on its operation by senior officials. I know we touched briefly on this at the beginning of our meeting. Um, I, I think um, members, I know certainly I'm not going to make any more comment on this really other than to say that I will raise, we, this will be raised, I would say, uh, next week whenever the department and the minister are in, in front of us um, to answer questions around this um, as well. So I just want to ask our members any further comments they want to make on this issue. Are they content to note? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, members, can I then ask you to move to agenda item five, which is correspondence. You'll find the correspondence memo at page 41. I want to draw your attention to two items, starting at page 47. And this is a request from the Council for the Homeless, NI, to brief on the programme for government housing outcome. I um, just want to ask members, are they content to receive an oral briefing following the conclusion of committee stage of the licensing bill? Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. And then, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mark. And then, can I draw your attention to page 80, where you'll see correspondence from the yeah. Belfast Metropolitan Residence Group yeah. in relation to living above the shop scheme, the lot scheme. Again, can I ask members, um, are they content um, to support the revival of the lot scheme and request a copy of the work done by DFC to date on the issue? And then also to ask if, if that is uh, in agreement, would they consider then a future briefing from BMRG on the lot scheme? So two requests there I'm asking you. Um, Kelly? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I would be quite keen to see this happening because um, 
when we look at the spatial planning in, in towns and what the, the way things are moving, it's certainly um, more towards town centre living and accessibility of, of services for people. Um, we have a wealth of, of places, shops that, that have accommodation above them that need a bit of support. Um, if we are having town centre living, then this is something we do need to consider. I know I had written to the department and, and and got the reply back that they weren't interested in opening up the living over the shop scheme again. But I think, to be honest, time has moved on that, that town centre living. And when you look at spatial planning and how architects and how town planners are looking um, at the development of, of residential accommodation, it is certainly something that is coming more to the fore, um, especially if we want to reduce down carbon emissions, um, less re reliance on people having to travel uh, and so on. So... I just think that, yeah, I I would wish to support the reviving of the liver, living over the shop scheme, just even to see if we can get more information about it and the difficulties with legislation. I know that there's issues about having accommodation over um, food places where, you know, there could be potential for fire hazards. Um, but I think it is something that we can't close the door on. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Any other uh, member want to make a comment? Yeah. Go ahead, Fran. Sure. <coughs> And I think as uh, the lot scheme has been talked about for for many many years, and even uh, during the, the the recent debate on lots in the assembly, there may have been a bit difference of opinion, but I think everybody was uh, looking towards the the the, the right direction. Uh, nothing can be done or should be done in isolation from the overall strategy uh, for housing where it's city centres, because I think that uh, beside the lot schemes, we have serious serious. I have to have a serious, serious look at where city centres are going to be after this uh, that, that, that we move out of uh, or back to some type of normality, you know, because we may be dealing with a lot more than the LAT scheme in terms of uh, empty buildings and, and things like that. So it should be part of the overall housing strategy, but also taking into consideration uh, the, 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 the impact in towns and city centres uh, after the, the, the corona's away. Oh, thank you for that, Fra. And I mean, Fra, you and I remember that we did discuss this during our the old days in DSD committee several years ago. So, I mean, there might not have been work done at, uh, on on the issue lately, but there certainly has been work done on uh, done on this issue on the past. Um, so it might be worth just trying to get as much information as we can on that. Um, Robin. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Your, your last few remarks. Uh, getting information, I think, is is going to be key, and to look at perhaps where successful schemes have happened, uh, either in GB or, or indeed internationally. I think that that would be important. I would not want to think that we should uh, <clears throat> give consideration only to the city centre. I do think there is even more potential on the arterial routes to actually develop uh, schemes that uh, might indeed, uh, because of the geography, be a lot easier to develop that than purely something that's um, allocated to a city centre. But I do agree that whatever we return to after this um, pandem the pandemic is over, it will be different. Uh, and indeed, the future of housing or the provision of, of accommodation rather than just the provision of housing is, is going to be entirely different. And I think, and I think we all know that the sector of the housing market that is most, housing need market, that is most uh, uh, impacted upon is young single men without responsibilities, or, or indeed women without responsibilities. And I do think the lot scheme, and particularly in an arterial route situation, contributes, could potentially contribute towards the provision of suitable accommodation for that type of applicant in particular probably isn't suitable for family living as, as such, but certainly for those young men and women who are at the very bottom of the housing executive uh, list at this moment in time, application list. I think there is potential to, to address their needs in a lot type schemes uh, on, on arterial routes in particular. Okay, thank you, Robin. Okay, members, so members then in agreement with uh, those proposals then? Yes, I think everybody is. Yeah, okay. All right, members, that's all I wanted to draw your attention to under <coughs> correspondence. Can I ask members if they anything that they want to bring up under correspondence? Nope. Okay. 
All right, members, then we will move on to agenda item six, which is forward work programme. Um, members, uh, okay, where am I even I looking really, here? But we don't actually, don't uh, well, <laughs> we don't know yet, I suppose, what are our, our, our dates and times for next week. Certainly, we do have to um, have a committee meeting next week on the, <coughs> the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill um, because we want to try and get that um, to come to some sort of conclusion on that, and then that will enable <coughs> us to then be able to get our, our clause by clause done as well. Um, so uh, that's certainly something that will be planned for next week. And then the other issue is the Minister, the Department and Sport NI. Um, so members, can I then just at this stage just say that we'll play that by ear for next week? Um, sure. and, sorry, go ahead, Fra. No, no, it's just a, a point from earlier on. We were talking about uh, an extra meeting or a full day. Was that next week or was that for some time in the future? No, that's next week, Fra, during recess. Jeremy says that's okay, no, no problem. Yeah, and so I take, I take it, uh, have you decided whether it'll be a one day thing or uh, 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 to split them? That hasn't, it, that, it's very much dependent on the minister and the minister's diary. Um, okay. So, and I, I don't know for definite if there's an executive meeting will take place next Thursday because they're generally on a Thursday as well. So we're just waiting back, really. We will work around um, the minister's diary on that. So if it does mean that we have to do a meeting on a Thursday and a meeting on a Wednesday, we'll do it if it's all day Thursday. But as I say, um, the, the committee clerk will notify members at, as soon as um, they get confirmation so members have notice. All right? Is that okay? Thank you. All right. No bother. Okay. I'm going to move on then to agenda item seven, which is AOB. I, I can ask this again at the end of the meeting if there's something comes up, but at this stage, is any other business members want to bring up? Nope. Okay. Then I'll sorry, ask. Yeah, Go sorry, ahead, Mark. Sorry. I'm eating a bit of toast. Sorry. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just freeze on now. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Now. It's been that much going on. Chair, no, we'd raised on com committee before the issue around post office card accounts. Yes. Uh, you know, I was never fully satisfied with the answer or responses that we got from the department. You know, there was talk of an exemption service for vulnerable people, you know, arrangements being made for vulnerable people, that they'd be able to maybe continue using their post office accounts. But over the past couple of weeks, there's been a third or fourth wave of these letters uh, to, to people telling them that they're going to have to get a bank account. You know, that, like this caused people anxiety and stress that this time last year or, sorry, or, or even more than a year ago before we had the onset of the pandemic and, and lockdown. But given that a lot of these people are pensioners, that you've plenty of people who are actually shielding them, who are getting these letters telling them they've to set up a bank account. Uh, and, and that, I suppose, combined with the fact that we've had announcements from more banks now saying that they're closing branches in the locations, I think it's something we need to get some clarity from the department on, on what exactly their plans are uh, for vulnerable people's payments to continue. Okay, thank you, Mark, for that. Um, Sean was trying to tell me something from the back of the room here, so can I ask him just to say whatever it is? We asked about maybe two weeks ago for a reply on this, we're still waiting a reply. Okay, I don't know if you heard that. Sean has said that we asked for a reply on this around two weeks ago, and we haven't received it as yet. Um, so I suppose that will be whenever we come back then after our, our, our week's recess. Um, that uh, we would expect to have it then, and if not, we can follow up on, on it then. Kelly? Thank you, Chair. And the same point, um, I was just going to say it might be worthwhile if we could get perhaps an update from HNI or the Older Persons Commissioner. Now, I know that the Older Persons Commissioner meets with banks on a regular basis. The issue is that when you are, well, could be over 80 and you have to go and open one of these bank accounts and you're asked for ID that you don't have. So if you stop driving, you won't have a driving license. If you're not going anywhere, you won't have a passport. So the photographic ID becomes extremely difficult to provide. Um, so it would, it would be useful. Now, I appreciate our time is very precious. So I'm only looking for a written update from those guys to what their opinion is um, from working within the sector and with older people um, just about this process and what uh, you know, have they any update they can provide for us that we can read sort of alongside whatever the department's going to come forward with? No, thanks, Kelly. It's a good suggestion. We can do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, members, happy enough with that? Or is there any other business they want to bring up? 
Nope. Okay, then I'm going to move us on then to agenda item 8, which is SL1, the Universal Credit Extension of Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of the SL1 at page 94. The proposed rule will extend the £86.67 uplift to the standard allowance of Universal Credit for a further six months and also extend the relaxation for the minimum income floor for self-employed claimants until the 31st of July 2021. Can I ask members, are they content for the department to proceed to make this rule? Yep, all content, I would imagine. Yes? I would love them to extend it by 12 months, but yeah. Yeah, well, I think it, that is something then when it comes to near that six months time that that we we will be lobbied on. Um, so that's okay. Um, members, agenda item nine is SR 2021-66, the automatic enrolment earnings trigger and qualifying earnings ban order Northern Ireland 2021. Um, members, you'll find a copy of this rule at page 98. Can I then ask members, have they any objections to the rule? No. Okay, members, then I'll put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-66, the Automatic Enrolment Earnings Trigger and Qualifying Earnings Band Order Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going to pause the meeting um, for a very short period. Um, and then um, we'll, we'll come back then on agenda item 10. Thank you. Or can get okay, members, can I move then to agenda item 10, which is uh, the continuation of committee, committee deliberations on the clauses of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, members, as I said, we'll continue our deliberations in the bill and we'll also have a closed session um, later with the bill office for further discussions and decisions on the clauses. Um, can I then ask Broadcasting to bring in all members and also then Carol Reid and Liam Quinn into the spotlight, please? There we go. We've got everybody in. Um, and can I just then welcome um, Carol and Liam uh, to the meeting here today? And then I, for, I'll just begin then. So first of all, members, I want to draw your attention to page 314 of your meeting pack, where you'll see information we've received from the Institute of Public Health Ireland. Can I ask members, would they be content to note and include a copy of the paper in the committee's final report? Great. Great. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, members, then, you've been provided a page 37 with the reply from the PSNI in relation to the idea of a late night levy. Um, again, can I then ask members, have they any comments or are they content to note? Any comments on page 317? Response from um, PSNI in relation to late night levy. Are they content to note? So what, what, what way would a late night levy work? Who do you pay it to? How much would they pay? And what is the, uh, what is the, the pen though? I know we had had discussions around this, and certainly um, Liam and Carl, feel free to come in here as well. Um, we'd had discussions around this that it would be paid by those that are open on those extra hours uh, at night time. Though I know certainly in our discussions we have had, we've, we've been looking now and saying, well, okay, a late night levy on paper sounds a, a really good idea. Um, but at present, with the state of our bars and restaurants and clubs and various places of entertainment, um, at, at this stage, uh, it would be quite unfair to, to impose that levy upon those clubs. I know that certainly has been the, the view of the committee. Um, but uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is a good idea, and it, it does work in other places around, um, around the, the UK. Um, I don't know if Liam and Carl want to give uh, any further answer to Frau on that. Chair, maybe just to, to say to, to Fra that, that the, um, the detail would have to be worked out on all of that. Um, there's different models used ar around the world, but um, mm -hmm. Chair is quite right. It would be those who are availing of, of late licences uh, who would help to pay for uh, clean up afterwards, uh, for policing, for health and, and emergency treatment for anybody who, who suffers, uh, but also possibly even for, for charities uh, who would help people get home You know, whenever they're, they're um, in, in, in distress. Uh, but there's no detail behind it as to how it would be collected or that and all that work would need to be done. Okay, I appreciate that. And I suppose there was a bit of a, a we had heard about, you know, that a, a vast percentage of it goes to statutory services and um, I know, I can't remember, I don't know, maybe it was Karen brought it up last week, about, um, you know, really 
um, if there was some sort of levy, we would need to then decide: should it be going to the, the voluntary and community sector? Should it be going to rehabilitation? You know, to help anybody with uh, alcohol-related issues. So I think when it comes to the levy, it's a much bigger issue than just basically saying let's do a levy. Um, there's a lot of, of other technical stuff that you have to go through it's to, to decide actually what percentage of it goes where. Um, Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, the levy, as you say, on paper, it sounds amazing, but the practicalities of working it out for this particular legislation, I think, is is a step beyond. I'm just wondering, from the Department's point of view, if we find after a period of time, whether it's a major event, um, the nighttime economy uh, with the extended hours, um, that there is a significant cost there, would that then, if we don't have it in this legislation, would that be... Secondary legislation, um, could it be added in through regulations or just to, to, to advise if, if it's not in this legislation, how would a future minister want to um, bring the levy in then? Well, I mean, specifically on, on the levy, uh, Chair, um, it would be primary legislation. Uh, it would be, we need to take a power to impose a levy on businesses, so that would be primary. Uh, I would imagine there would be a lot of secondary associated with it then to actually decide how the levy would be distributed. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, members content then. Um, the proposal is that we're content to note um, the, the, what the PS and I have sent us. Are they happy with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, members. Um, then can I ask you then, uh, you've been provided with a tabled letter from Hospitality Ulster requesting that committees support its call for rural pubs to be able to diversify and provide a range of community services and local farmers, produce, etc. This type of trading uh, is evidenced across the UK as the pub of the hub model. Hospitality Ulster proposed that we could this could be accomplished by change to regulations. Um, I mean, as far as I'm aware, uh, we know this is not in these regulations, um, so it isn't. It would be a, a different set of of uh, regulations. Um, um, I suppose uh, maybe come and, and ask. Sorry, can I go to Liam and Carol first, and then I'll bring you in, Kelly, um, just around that proposal. Yeah, Chair, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I mean, in terms of a bit of background, Pub is the Hull, Pub is the Hub. Sorry, um, it's a not it's a not for profit organisation based in GB. So they have volunteers who provide independent specialist advice to particularly the rural pubs um, on rural diversification. So basically, where a local community has been left maybe without a bank or without a grocer's or without a bakery or a library or something like that. Um, Hospitality Ulster engaged with us in, I think it was September 2019, as part of the department's consultation um, then and, and raised the issue with us. Now, as part of that, um, Hospitality Ulster were to go and do a wee piece of work on what the need would be here. Um, and the department then looked into the feasibility of it in terms of, in terms of the current law. And again, it's as usual, it's not exactly straightforward. So prior to the, the current legislation, which is the 1996 order, um, the, the law back then, the legislation actually prohibited any other business from being carried on in a pub. The 1996 order withdrew that. Um, so the department sought legal advice on that particular issue to determine then, does it mean that that is possible and legal within the current legislation? Um, our solicitors have come back and said that although it doesn't say it's illegal, that she would caution against saying that it is actually legal. And that she there was a, there was a number of issues raised. Um, it was around where um, whenever a, a current pub would go to a court for a license, um, a court looks at the suitability of the premises, and obviously now that's just the premises for the license of alcohol. Um, they wouldn't be looking at what else goes on. And the the, the solicitor cautioned that. Potentially, then at renewal stage, if a if a pub was to go to a court and now had for talk's sake a library in it, would the court then have issue whether that was actually a suitable premises to hold a license? Um, similarly, there's alterations. There's a process for alterations. I think we've actually discussed um, recently in the licensing legislation, and any changes that specifically would affect the means of passage between where a like or where a pub would sell alcohol um, and any other parts. Um, they have to go to, to court in advance. So there's a number of issues there that the solicitor has just urged caution about. Um, Hospitality Ulster did propose using a set of regulations or power to make regulations that's already in the order, but the, the solicitor confirmed that that wouldn't be suitable. Um, the, the regulations that Hospitality Ulster are referring to um, talks about 
prescribing conditions under which any business authorised by the licence can be carried on. The business authorised by the licence under the licence and order is, is, is the sale of alcohol. Um, so the one that's used at the minute for that, the only the regulations there are the mixed trading regs. So that's for your supermarkets where they're basically able to say how you sell alcohol in a supermarket as opposed to what Hospitality Austria is suggesting with how you do another business while you sell alcohol. So it's not, we don't have a straightforward answer for you on that one chair. Um, the solicitor has urged just caution against it that it's, that it's not quite clear at the moment. Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, Kelly, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I was just going to, to be honest, thank you very much um, for your, your explanation, Carl, because that's what had me completely confused. Um, I live in a rural area and the rural pubs here are certainly the hub. Um, I know of a few who have diversified into having, um, you know, a, a small shop attached to it. And they, of course, could if they wish to apply for a, a post office license in the future. Um, I just I, I couldn't quite understand why there needed to be extra regulations. But I think you've, you've clarified that for me. Um, yeah, it's 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 outside this at the moment and there does need to be a bit more work on it but as you as, as has been said it would be regulations as opposed to primary legislation so i'm happy enough with that I, I understand better now what the limitations are on the pubs currently you know as you say it's not illegal but it's not good practice to to extend beyond their license yeah thank you okay thanks kelly karen you have your hand up Thank you, Chair, uh, and same as Kelly, Carol, thank you for, for that explanation. Um, uh, it is all very interesting as we work our way through this. I was just wondering, Carol, um, has Hospitality Ulster cited um, any options? You know, is there any villages or towns currently? Um, you know, have they produced any papers around what it would look like or a pilot of, of say, a village at the minute that does not have... Uh, you know, a post office, a shop, and the only um, hub is the pub. Uh, I was just wondering, did they go any further? We haven't received anything so far. I think work potentially had begun on it, but um, the the pandemic then starting early in la early last year. Say this was this engagement took place in September two thousand and nineteen. Um, so no, there there's been nothing forthcoming as yet. Thank you, Carol. And I suppose, members, there's nothing to stop us um, whenever we do our final report, um, whenever we do the report from the committee, um, that we, we can't make some comment about this within the report, um, that it is something that we'd certainly would maybe want the department to explore further. Um, given the fact, and I know Mark has brought it up several times as well, where, where we have villages and small towns um, where we, we, whenever you see the loss of a licence, from then, you know that's that's the license gone. Whereas if we could be doing something to help these 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 smaller local village pubs and local town pubs um, to be sustainable, um, that is something certainly that we need to that we need to, to look at. But again, we'll discuss discuss it in closed session. But it is certainly something we can put in our report at the end to say that we've 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 heard what they're saying and that it's certainly maybe we would recommend that in the future. Um, that this be that, that, that some exercise that they scope out some exercise to look at how this can be achieved. So members happy enough then with with that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, members. Then I'm going to take it on to. Uh, okay, you've been provided then in your tabled papers also a letter from the Market Inn in Draperstown regarding concerns over tap rooms. The letter highlights that the pub trade is currently held to account by the value of their licence, and to adopt the tap room the tap room model would undermine this and add further uh, unfair competition in an already struggling tr trade. And also just to make us aware that since you that that the table paper went out, we've received a further two more similar letters um, from the same constituency. And they I'll just to let you know that they'll go into the, the next committee meeting pack. Um, members, I propose that we note the letter and consider the issues later when we get to the deliberations on clause eight. Um, when we'll commit our, we'll consider the department response on that issue. Are members happy enough with that? Yes. Okay, members, then can I just say then you've been provided then again a, a table papers with a departmental response on the questions raised by the Society of Independent Brewers regarding the discussion on the issue of tap rooms at its meeting on the 11th of March. 
Um, uh, can I then ask members, have they any comments on that? That is where that we'd received the letter that they were disputing um, that uh, tap rooms had been part of the conversation um, prior to, to us receiving the bill. Um, so, just members, any comments, any questions? I know Liam is here. I don't know if Liam, if you want to make further comment on, on that response. Mr. Chair, thanks. Um, well, the, the department has provided a comprehensive response to, to the inquiry, and um, I have nothing really further to add. Okay, members, any further questions they want to ask around mm -hmm. that? No. Nope. Okay. All right, members. Then you can we'll go. Then where are we now? Okay, members, you've been provided separately with a copy of the delegated powers memorandum from the examiner of statutory rules. Can I then ask members if they have any comments on that, or are they content to note? Content. content. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. members, after the meeting on the 11th of March, when we started our deliberations, we wrote to the department with queries on several clauses. Um, so the departmental responses are at page 319, and. Um, uh, members uh, Liam and Carol are here to answer any further queries that we might have. So then we'll start that and I suggest we go through the responses of each clause starting then with clause 1 and 23 relating to the removal of additional restrictions at Easter. Members of the committees queried um, the issue of staff protection if they did not wish to work the additional hours at Easter. The Department of the Economy has advised that there is no statutory provision to require employers to allow workers to opt out of working on religious festivals unless there is a specific agreement on the matter within the initials contract of employment or written statement of terms and conditions. This applies to all uh, employees, workers, irrespective of which sector they worked in. Um, uh, DFE further advises that employers would need to be aware that a refusal to grant Christian employees time off for any of the bank holidays with religious significance could amount to indirect religious discrimination if it places them in a particular disadvantage when compared with employees in other faiths or non-religious employees. Um, members, uh, um, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm content with the response. I think we knew that was going to be the response, but just to ask if members any comment on that. Are any further questions they want to ask around that of Liam or Carol? Mm -hmm. Nope, happy enough. Okay, members. Um, so we're happy enough then with that response, yes? Okay. Okay, members, we now move then on to the department's response on clause four regarding police authorization for additional hours. Members, the committee proposed that if it considered that if it considered the increase to 104 days of clubs to match other licensed premises, then it made sense to do the same um, for small pubs and clubs also. The Minister is minded to consider the proposal from the Committee to increase the number of police authorisation for additional hours. Should the Minister agree with the Committee's proposal, the Department would take forward the amendment subject to executive agreement. Can I ask members, do they wish to propose an amendment on this clause? Uh, this clause? And if so, we can discuss that later whenever we're in closed session. I think there was overall support here from members that everyone move up to 104 days. So we would ask then that Liam and Carol take that back um, to the minister. That adds certainly the committee's view. Yeah? yeah. All right. OK, members. Then we need to consider the response on Clause 5 regarding the extension on drinking up time. Um, members, we queried the, bill, the building in of a review of this provision on the face of the bill. The Minister is content to provide a written commitment to a review of the extension of drinking up time um, as the evaluation and review of the extension is vital in terms of providing an evidence base should there be any need to revert back to 30 minutes via the power included in the bill. I just want to remind members um, that there had been discussions last week on the potential for a wider review clause. Um, to cover other aspects of the bill also. Yeah. So you may wish to consider this de this decision um, later on in closed session, or if there's anything you want to ask of Liam and Carol on that issue. And the Minister's response? Are we we're happy enough that we discuss that in closed session um, and make our decision today whether we want to do an overall review? Let me hear you. Yeah, I'd be content with that approach, Chair. Okay, okay, then we'll look at it in closed session, yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, um, 
Members, we're now going to move to the response to Clause 15 and 30, which is regarding prohibition of self-service and vending machines. We agreed with the clause, but queried if an honesty box in the guest house was also covered. Um, uh, officials have discussed the issue with the bill's drafts person and believe that honesty boxes should be captured or would be captured in the prohibition clause under 15 and 30. I know I had brought that up, and I'm certainly content with that response. I'll ask members, are they content also? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, members, can we then move on to the response to clause 16 regarding restrictions of on off sales drinks promotions in supermarkets, uh, etc.? We sought clarity on the distribution of leaflets and brochures. Officials have discussed this with the bill's drafts person and believe that the distribution of leaflets within the 200 metre radius would be captured under clause 16. It should be noted, however, that only leaflets bro bro or brochures which wholly or mainly promote the purchase on those premises are captured. Again, are members content with that response? I think that clears that issue up as well, but if members feel differently, um, certainly say aye. It, it does a wee bit, okay. Chair. But say, for example, and I'll, I'll just pick a, a shop, say Spar or Eurospar, okay, and there are loads of Eurospars everywhere, okay, and they have something common offers, Okay, so say Eurospar had an offer on cans of Carlsberg, 12 cans for £10 or, or, or whatever, and the leaflet was produced that had that information on it. <laughs> and these leaflets were sent out along with newspapers or through Royal Mail or, or, or through another delivery agent. <laughs> and, and they came in to doors or addresses within 200 metres of a Eurospar. <laughs> That you see, because that promotion wouldn't be wholly in, in the Eurospar within that two hundred meters, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Sorry, they confuse things a wee bit. I wouldn't be like you, Mark. Um, Liam or Carol, have you any any response to that? Yeah, chair, I can take that one. So the Sorry, the promotion. Carl. So I know you're okay. The the promotion itself, it wouldn't be classed as a promotion under the under the under the bill, um, because the brochure itself isn't wholly or mainly to promote alcohol if it's one if it's one item. Um, you know, realistically what you're talking here is a brochure that is really, you know, the, the a large percentage of it or it's in its entirety is for alcohol sales. If it's a generic yeah. Eurospar brochure that has grocery products in it as well and it happens to have a single page on on alcohol that's available in those specific premises, um, then, then it would be captured. But the, the the example that you've given there, I don't believe would. But but even if the leaf the brochure was entirely alcohol, <laughs> would it? Because there are so many other euro spars, so you would say that it isn't wholly or even mainly. Well, I believe there if it was. Sorry, I spoke over the top of you there. It's difficult whenever you're on here and we can't see anybody. Um, if if it's related to those specific premises, so in those circumstances, I'm trying to think, if you had a Eurospar leaflet that went out, I imagine it would apply to all Eurospars. Uh -huh. In which case, I believe it would be captured if it, reply, if it applies to one specific, in one specific town, um, then it would have to be within 200 metres of that specific Eurospar. Okay. Sorry, sorry. That clear Thanks, that up for you. Thanks, Chair. And sorry, Chair, just to record an interest from me as well, please. No problem. All right, Mark. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, any other members want? Are we? We're then we're content with that response from the department. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We're going to move on then to clause seventeen, which is regarding the prohibition on loyalty schemes. Uh, we mm -hmm. noted the operation of different loyalty schemes across the UK and the Republic of Ireland, and request further information on these in terms of the inclusion of alcohol sales. In summary, the department has advised that Sainsbury's website states that spirits and liquors. Um, are no longer included in promotions and coupons in the same way that baby formula fuel stamps, tobacco and other excluded items are not. And the Tesco's website states you can't collect points on some products due to various legal, regulatory 
or contractual reasons. It also states that where minimum unit pricing or permitted pricing applies, a customer may not receive all of the discount on alcohol purchased. Again, for me, members, I'm happy enough with that response we received from the department. Can I ask then, are other members content with that clarification? Intent. Yeah. Okay. Okay, members. Then we're going to move on to the response on clause six and twenty-five, which is regarding major events. And um, the department states, uh, should there be a situation in the future where no minister is in place, the power to designate a major event under clauses six and twenty-five could still be taken by a senior official within the department. Again, members, um, can I ask, are we content with that response as well? Yeah. Yes, yeah. content. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, then, members, we're going to remove a little. We're going to move on to the response on clause eight regarding license for off sales. We query that if committee propose propose, would the minister be minded to take forward amendment to include a a provision for tap rooms? In summary, the response highlights that the 2016 bill did not include a provision for local producers of alcoholic drinks, although it was discussed during evidence sessions. It also states that without a minister in place at the time, the department's consultation in October 2019 sought general opinion on licensing laws and asked, the pu asked for public opinion on the adequacy of the current number of premises which were eligible to apply for a liquor license. Responses included calls for local producers to be able to sell directly to the public. It is the department's view that in the absence of compelling evidence for or against allowing the licensing of tap rooms, the minister would not agree to take forward such an amendment. However, should the committee propose an amendment based on signed evidence, then a minister will consider all the information available. The minister is minded, however, to commit to the depart department carrying out the relevant research and producing a report on the issue in the Assembly and state that it would not be appropriate to provide a commitment on the face of legislation to introduce tap rooms when the outcome of any re research or consultation is unknown. Okay, members, can I then um, open up again the floor and ask the members want to make any comment on this around the, minister, the, the response from the department on this? Kelly? Thank you, Chair. A um, little bit concerned by the response in this when it talks about sound evidence. Um, there has been no, you know, previously there, there had been no need to gather up sound evidence. Um, I know that, that, that we as the committee have heard and have received a lot of correspondence on this um, to our, um, you know, consultation that we put out. Um, we've heard from a lot of different stakeholders in particular, I was very interested to find out, um, you know, if it would confirm my thoughts on tap rooms and the relation to the food and drink industry for tourism. Um, to be honest, I would be minded that that the committee does consider taking forward an amendment on this. Um, if we were to wait for the department, look how long this liquor licensing has taken to get forward. Um, if we're waiting on the department um, to complete legislation or complete review, it would hold back this legislation if we wanted to go in here. And to be honest, I don't think it would see the light of day in this mandate because the minister has so much on her plate with the amount of legislation coming forward. And it would mean then that tap rooms wouldn't have an opportunity, um, to be honest, for the next few years to even be considered again. Um, I appreciate that, that there is the talk there about sound evidence, um, but maybe the the, uh, the officials here could maybe confirm what that sound evidence would look like for the minister. Liam or Carol want to answer that? Yes, Chairman, uh, uh, I think, or Chairperson, sorry, uh, I think what we're, the minister would be looking for would be um, the economic and social impacts, really. Um, I mean, the uh, the brewers will certainly benefit from the proposals in the, the bill currently, which allows for them to sell on the internet. It allows them to sell from their premises for people to take the drink away. Uh, it allows them to take their products to Balmoral Show, for example, and sell there. Uh, it also allows them to organise tours, uh, and that's where the link to tourism, uh, I believe, it comes in. And, uh, you know, all, all the pop Politicians, uh, and this is this is probably the second time really this has been uh, through committee stage because it was very close to the end last time, and all of the members on, on the previous committee and this committee could see the benefits 
of all those proposals, which is why the Minister has now included them in the bill. The, the, the bit about tap rooms takes it a, a step further. Um, and, and that's really, as I said before, you know, they will be operating almost as many pubs and it's, it's the economic impacts of, of, of these. Uh, so we also need to look at uh, other issues around how and where they would be able to operate. Um, the, the premises used by a lot of the breweries currently simply wouldn't be suitable uh, for people to consume alcohol on the premises. They're essentially uh, industrial sites with, with limited toilet facilities. They are based in industrial estates on some occasions where you would have deliveries to other nearby um, nearby uh, industrial sites. You know, forklift trucks, for example, transferring across the product. And you have people who have consumed alcohol leaving those premises, you know, potentially late at night. So there, there's a lot of issues to be taken into account. We'd also need to look at, you know, what is a clear definition of a tap room? Um, does it, uh, would it, would it would extend to, for example, breweries, uh, cider producers, gin manufacturers, so that people could sit and, and drink gin or whiskey um, all day long? Um, you know, would it just be limited to small producers, or could, for example, Guinness or Heineken set up a site in, in uh, one of our, our towns or cities? You know, these are the sort of things we need to, to hammer out. Uh, there's a lot of issues as well then around you know how they would operate in practice. You know what what would the permitted hours be? Would children be allowed in, on premises? Would entertainment be permitted? Um, would gaming machines be permitted? Would they be permitted to broadcast sports events and and uh, compete directly with with pubs when it comes to you know rugby internationals, Ulster rugby matches, Premier League soccer? And um, these are all the issues that that, that would need to be looked at. Um, and, and the main context then is what is the economic and, and social impact? I have to say, Liam, um, all that you've said there is all quite negative. Um, and, you know, these organisations have to comply. I, I was a former health and safety officer, Nibosh qualified. Um, you can't operate a manufacturing premises without meeting health and safety regulations. So all that you've talked about um, as far as health and safety would be concerned is covered. Um, my concern is that everything's always about the competition with pubs. Um, how about we actually may be able to produce more jobs, um, that we actually may be able to develop our tourism market, that there actually is an economic uplift from this, not all competition against pubs. Um, I agree that there's a lot of information that needs to be considered. Um, I know, having spent the last few months speaking to the different producers, there are some who will never go down this road. They'll never have a tap room. They don't want to have a tap room. But there are others who, um, as you say, will have opportunities now through this legislation, which we absolutely welcome. But I just don't think it's gone far enough. And I do think that, um, I know that the complaints have come through. I do think that there does seem to be a protection with the um, the, the pubs and hotels. Um, they're an important part of our tourism industry. But this is another potential addition to it. Um, and I, I would very much like to see us exploring this. I'm not going to ask with a tap room that they have something that would take away from a pub. They're not pubs. They'll only be able, I think, to sell their own produce. Um, but I just think that if someone from a rural constituency, I'm looking at this and going, are we just protecting the centre of Belfast here? Um, I have a wealth of organisations who are being prevented and have been prevented from developing their produce. The, it's a Northern Ireland project, um, and while there are certain opportunities in the legislation so far, I think that all I'm hearing from the department is the negative side of a tap room when actually in a rural area to get jobs into our rural area using local produce would be wonderful. Um, and I just think that there's an opportunity here that I really don't want to go past. Um, I think that we could have a review period built in, and I think that there's an opportunity here, but of course we we'll, would we'll need to discuss that as a committee. I just think that it has been talked about so much. It was talked about by the previous committee. There has been information provided. I just think that the signed evidence is there. It just needs pulled together. That's me, Chair. Okay, look, Kelly, thank you. Liam, can I just ask, and I probably should know the answer to this, um, but uh, when it comes to our, our small producers um, in this legislation, are, does this allow them to give a sample after a tour? Uh, yes, yes, Chair. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Does it does it have have they said what size of sample or how many samples or anything within it or is it? No, Chair. The, 
Chair, the, uh, the uh, primary legislation will allow regulations to be made to set the, the level of, of uh, sample or testers that can be provided. Okay. It will depend on the type of product that they're, they're tasting, obviously. I mean, I suppose this is, as you know, this is an issue um, that we have heard a lot of evidence on and, and um, very much have been lobbied about as well. I can certainly see the positives that this would bring, the positives that we bring to Northern Ireland, the positives that bring to our tourism, and and our general model of of, of socialising and uh, and and how we do that. Um, I do also see the other side of unintended consequences, um, and I think you had mentioned them one of one of them there, Liam, Liam, as to what's to stop um, one of our our our. our big producers or one of our major um, uh, bar owners or hotel owners within Northern Ireland coming into my constituency in the Cathedral Quarter, buying one of those lovely big large buildings and turning it into a brewery and it becoming, you know, very much, it would be, uh, uh, yeah, it would be done actually wonderfully well. So I think there's unintended consequences certainly that we need to look at at whenever, whenever we're doing this. I know certainly from, a, from what I can read, from what the committee are saying, if they do are minded to look at tap rooms, it, there will have to be um, strict and specific rules around that um, because, it, 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 again, it's the unintended consequences and actually those unintended consequences could actually squeeze those smaller producers even further. So it could. Um, so I, I mean, that's certainly my, my opinion on it is I would like to see us do something, but it, it, it's that level of something. And I think that's probably something the committee will discuss in, in closed session, um, definitely, because we all represent areas that um, certainly have small producers within them, whether that is in city or rural. Um, and we, we, we do want to help them in any way we can. So that's just what I want to say on it. I do under, I just want to put that unintended consequences out there as well. Um, I do get that. I know, Alex, you're waving frantically at me there. Go ahead. Can't hear you. You're on mute. Yeah, right. I'm back on. Um, no, I agree with everything that Kelly and yourself have been saying. I, I really want to explore this more. And it just seems if we don't take this opportunity now, that, that it's never going to happen for them. Um, so um, I think the department have been incredibly negative. Um, I'm not sure why. All, all, all the health and safety and all the things that would be needed for this can be done quite easily. And, and put in place. So I really don't understand the negativity, but um, I'd be very keen as a committee to discuss more of what we can do on this and explore it more, if that's possible. Thank you. Okay, I, I do think this is something we will discuss in closed session, um, certainly after the meeting, um, because we do need, I mean, it, yes, we absolutely need to need, make decisions that are evidence based, um, but we also make, need to make decisions that are balanced as well. Um, throughout this bill, and, and um, that's why I do think we need to look at something. Um, what that something's going to look like, I don't know yet. Um, but I'll maybe just leave it there. Any other members want to make any more comment on this, or Liam or Carl, anything you want to come back on from any of the suggestions or anything that's been said? Uh, maybe, Chair, I'll just add, and I'm sorry if I came across as, as negative, that certainly wasn't the intention, uh, particularly to Kelly, and the points that Kelly made are, are well made, and, and there may well be a, a, an economic benefit. Uh, I no doubt there will be an economic benefit, in, but to small a small sector, the extent or, or size of that benefit, we don't know, uh, and th that's really what I'm saying. So um, the issue around health and safety, of course, yeah, it's slightly different whenever you have people consuming alcohol on a site because they don't always behave rationally. And that's, I'm just highlighting that. This isn't a normal uh, industrial site where, where you can train people that they have to wear you know, and, and take certain uh, approaches. You know, there, there are people consuming alcohol. But, but I'm sorry if I came across as negative. That certainly wasn't the intention. Okay, thank you, Liam. Okay, any other members? Sorry. sorry, go ahead, Mark. Did you want to comment? Yes, Chair. I, 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 well, I'm on record before like recognising, accepting and, and welcoming uh, the economic impact that these local producers can have and, and that this bill as drafted will allow them to have and indeed <coughs> they're asked to explore tap rooms. It was just something you'd asked there, Chair, that, 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 that got me thinking and it was around the tours and, you know, sample size or quantity of, of samples. Could it be the case that this bill will allow local producers 
they'll be allowed to give samples as part of a tour, but could the place have like a, a five pound tour, a 10 pound tour, a 15 pound tour? And the number of samples that you can get are, are directly proportional to the tour that you've taken. Good point. I don't know, Liam, Nanny. If someone can pay fifteen pound at the door and get three pints yeah. rather than five or for five or three times. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The chair, the, uh, the regulations on, on samples will come back before the assembly, uh, so members will have the opportunity to, to comment on those. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, thing about, about regulations is we, we want to keep uh, detailed information like this out of the bill so that it can be changed again in future, you know, if something else comes up. But uh, yes, but what Mark's proposing, uh, you know, you know, people may want to have you know, the, the, the gold standard tour, um, and, and that, if that's what they want to do and price it accordingly, uh, that, that, that'll be fine. It'll be a matter for the Assembly as to the number and uh, size of samples that will be provided at the end of the tour. Now, Mark, thank you for throwing that one into the mix as well. I think that's, that, that's certainly something that we, we can have a chat about when we go into your closed session as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, any other comments on this issue? Because uh, we will be discussing it later. Anything you want clarified? By Liam, go ahead, Kelly, you need another question? Okay. I, um, the unintended consequence, I think, that the tap rooms are going to have to realise is that they will have a change in their rates value, um, you know, if they do choose to take a tap room. It's not all roses around the door for them. Um, there is, as, as Liam has pointed out, you know, if they have to comply if we go down this road um, with new health and safety um, absolutely you know it, it's not going to be a cheap option for them and that's why we have to recognize this is not forcing people to have tap rooms where they manufacture their products it's it's a choice for them if, if it's brought forward and it is a small sector but it's a sector that we've seen elsewhere has um, a huge um, potential to um, grow tourism thank you okay thank you kelly so can I then take it members then are happy enough with those responses that, um, okay, because we're, we're going to leave that part now, so we are, I think. Is there any other questions members want to ask Liam and Carol while they're on at the moment? You can bring them back in yeah. after the closed session if we, if we have yep. time and if we need to. Yeah, uh, Janice is just reminding me here that Liam and Carol have been made aware that we, we might ask them to come back in again after our closed session um, to answer some questions. I'm sure they'll be delighted uh, to hear that. Um, so, members, are they happy enough then that we uh, let Liam and Carol go at this stage? Yeah. And um, if we need them back, we'll bring them back. Thanks. Thank you to the both of you at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, then um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to agenda <laughs> item 13, uh, which is date, time, location of our next meeting. Again, um, but that, that will follow in an email from the clerk as to what date and time we're meeting at next week, if members are happy enough with that. Uh, members, we're going to go into closed session um, then shortly to discuss um, further responses. Can I then, before we move into closed session, can I ask Broadcasting to move Claire up? Claire's not on the call yet, is she? No, she's not on the call yet. Um, what we are going to do is go into closed session and then ask broadcasting whenever Claire comes on to the call, can they move her up into the spotlight? Okay, thank you, members. Can I just remind all those in Starleaf to remain on our call? And um, I'll finish the meeting at this stage and go into closed session. Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.